So tonight, I have a message that, well, I have a little story that goes behind the message. But before we get started, uh, do that, I'm one, I kind of like to read the scripture that the story goes with. So are you guys all right with that? Doesn't really matter whether you're all right with it or not. I'm going to do it that way. In John chapter 8 with me, we're going to start in verse 1. And for those of you who don't know, this is a familiar uh, part of Scripture. In John chapter 8, verse 1. And I'm going to ask Adam. Adam, I know I could probably do my slides from here, but would you mind doing slides back there? Dude, uh, thumbs up. I love it. Thank you. Makes, makes life a little bit easier for me to not have to think about that kind of stuff. In John chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Now, for those of you who don't have the cool Bible like me, mine actually says most ancient Greek manuscripts do not include John chapter 7, verse 53, through 8, uh, verse 11. And I would love to tell you that I spent weeks finding out what that means and why, but it didn't. So I don't know. So if your Bible says that, why they chose to not put it in some of the ancient Greek texts, I don't know. But if you want to know and you don't feel like looking at it, let me know and I'll have Dave look it up for you. You good with that, Dave? No? He said no. Well, we'll figure it out. We'll f- I'm one of those that if I don't know the answer and somebody really wants to know the answer, I have no problem finding the answer. I just usually have to be motivated to find that answer. How many of you grew up hearing when you asked a question that your parent didn't know the answer to? Look it up. Did you ever hear that? And, and yes, I am old enough to where we had these wonderful books on our walls that were called Encyclopedia. Not the Britannica encyclopedias. We, weren't, we didn't have enough money for those. We had these other older ones that, had, that were like paperback. <laughs> they weren't any good, really. Um, they didn't even have the Vietnam War in them. They were so old. So when you looked under V, there was no Vietnam War. And, uh, but I found it funny that my parents would always tell me, look it up. And so whenever there was a question, I'd be like, hey, so why is this happening? And I used to think, man, my parents are just so smart, and they know the answer. And so they're telling me to go look it up because they want me to search out the knowledge. What I didn't realize was this was about five years ago, my mother confessed. I just told you to go look it up because I didn't know the answer. And I thought, huh. So I took notes on that. And so every once in a while, my children will ask me a question, and I'll say, look it up, very proudly, as if I have this wisdom and knowledge that's just stored up, waiting to go out to them, but I'm going to make them search for the knowledge of what really I have no idea what the answer is. And sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. But tonight I am reading from John chapter 8. This is one of my favorite stories to read in scripture. It's not always the most popular, but it is one of my favorites. It says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning, he was back at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, This woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something that they could later use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, 
Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. And I don't, I don't have it in my, in my notes, but I just want to read verse 12 because it's, I love that. Jesus spoke to the people once more and said, I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you will have the light that leads to life. Verse 12 is a good, solid verse that I always love to hang on to. But uh, in this story, we hear about the woman caught in adultery. Not just sinned, but she was caught. And then drug in front of people to kind of pay for her crime. But the worst part was, was it wasn't that her sin was the issue. It was the fact that they were trying to trap Jesus. You see, a lot of people today want to trap Jesus. And our initial thought process, because I can tell you, even as a young child, when I would hear this story read to me, my initial thought is, Jesus, pick up one of the stones and hit those dudes square in the head. Reenact, you know, let's do a full-blown, hey, this is what David did to Goliath. And hit those dudes and get them out of there because that's wrong. How dare you treat a lady that way? You know, my mother was one of those that growing up, she would tell me often uh, if my dad did something right, she would be very quick to say, you see that? That's how you treat your wife. And if my dad did something wrong, she was very quick to say, see that? Don't treat your wife that way. And so one of the reasons I think my marriage has lasted is so wonderfully as it has is because I, I paid attention to my mother and telling me how I should and should not treat my wife. Um, and my dad's a really great guy. Don't, don't think he's a, he's, he was the first one to tell me, go look it up. So he's smart too. But you see, so often we want to jump up and fight. We want to defend You know, we're in a situation in our country right now where it's tough to be a Christian. It's tough to be somebody who believes in certain values. It's tough to convince people that you're the right way. And what we really want to do is jump up and punch them in the nose so that they can understand the logic that you're trying to share with them. I remember as a child, my sisters were the type that would take my stuff. I didn't take their stuff because it was Barbies and pink and purses, and I didn't like any of it. And thanks to them, we were justified in having flowers all over my house. And one sister, her room had to be purple, and one sister had to be pink, and I didn't like either of it so I had dinosaurs. But growing up, they would take my stuff and hide it and thought it was funny. Little did I know that my uh, younger sister, Jennifer, who's the middle child, was the one help encouraging my youngest sister to do it. She would squirrel my favorite G.I. Joes all over the house, and I would not be able to find them, and then I would go into the room and I would find them, but I never took their stuff. And then one day... It happened. They took my brand new G.I. Joe. You know, the one that I hadn't lost the little rifle to or the backpack. And I was, I was digging through their room and I found it. And that was it. Both the girls walked in and saw me find it and they giggled and laughed. And I screamed at the top of my lungs, Mom, they took my stuff again. And my mother very calmly said, did you find it? Yeah. Then what's the problem? The problem is they took my stuff. So to get back at them, I picked up one of their Barbie type dolls. And it was one of those weird ones that had the rubber legs that you could bend and they would click into place. You know, Barbie with a knee problem. It was just like, click, 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 you know. 
and I bent them the wrong way. And then got grounded for a week because of my retribution. (laughs) You see, I was upset that they kept taking my stuff. And so my idea was, that's it. I'm going to handle it. You see, so often we feel like it is our job to handle the situation. Scripture tells us that the battle belongs to the Lord. And so there are times where we need to stand up. There are times where we need to be proud that we serve a great God. There are times where we need to be strong. But it takes more strong, more strength, excuse me, more strength to not do something sometimes than it does to actually do something. I remember I met a pastor who had um, pastored a church for many, many years. And he was really just this, this great guy. He was really uh, an amazing pastor. And I remember saying to him, how did you pastor? He had pastored a church for 35 years. And I said, how did you do that? How did you pastor the same church for 35 years? And this was in uh, South Carolina where I was visiting. And he goes, I can show you exactly how I did it. And he called me into his office, and we went into his office, and he had this little closet-looking thing. And he opened up the door to the closet, and there was a foam, uh, the floor was like foam inside. And you could see where it had kind of impressions throughout the foam. And he said, that right there is how I was able to pastor here for 35 years. Because he spent so much time on his knees praying through situations that he had literally worn indentations in the foam floor. Now, there was a part of me going, I wonder how long he was praying before he said, I really need to get foam floor in here. But I am trusting that that's what it took. And so often we get frustrated or we say, this is what needs to happen. That's what needs to happen. Well, you know what I would do? I would punch that guy in the nose if he cut me off in traffic. Some of you may have even signaled a particular signal to people that have cut you off in traffic and then pulled into the church. I was driving to the church uh, uh, about two weeks ago. And this person comes flying up. I was on Frederick Street coming in, comes flying up, flew right past me. I mean, so fast. It was one of those moments where I caught myself saying, where are those police officers with the guns now? And by guns, I mean the radar guns. I don't want them like out there shooting at people, you know. I mean the radar guns. Some of you might have been like, yeah, they shoot the tires out, it'll be fine. No, they were in front of me. That would have caused an accident and then I'd have been late. And I see them fly. And they move so fast that there was a couple walking on the sidewalk. And they even were like, what is going on? And as I'm pulling up, that person's in front of me. And I watch them turn right into the church. And I went, ooh. Turned out, this is in the middle of the week. Some of you are like, which Sunday morning was this, Pastor Pete? It was during the middle of the week. Apparently, this was a parent of a child who had been hurt. And so mom was coming to pick up the child. And so we don't know why people act the way they do sometimes. But you see, I'm getting upset. I'm getting ready to be righteous indignation. And yet this was a mom trying to help a child. You know what's so funny is my wife, if you don't know her, I encourage you to meet her. She's the sweetest person on the face of the planet. Like, literally, it's, it's awful sometimes because I'm very much not the sweetest person on the face of the planet. She very much is. She's a good balance. Like, you know how they say you need to be married to that balance? As sweet as she is, I am the opposite of that. 
And so she's just amazing. And usually people are like, oh, she's so wonderful. And I'm like, that just means I'm that much awful. But you see, so often we don't realize what is going on behind the scenes. And my wife is very quick to remind me of that. When I'll say, well, you know what this person needs? And usually it's a small child, and I'll say, you know what they need? It's a whooping. You remember whoopings, anyone? Some of you are like, we didn't call them whoopings. We just called it daily dose of discipline. I have a slight story to tell you. So my mother, when I was three, I was in a, a, day, a preschool program. And I would go, and the way the preschool program worked is the parents would come in to the front desk, pick up the child, and the, uh, the aides would come, gather the child, and bring him to their room. Every day I got home, I was yelled at, told that I should be better behaved, and then would receive a spanking for three weeks, every day, every day. And then finally, my mother had had enough. Because she's like, what? Like, because you know when your kids act rowdy at home and nobody sees it, it's one thing. But like when they go and visit people and you hear about how wonderful and great they are, you're like, thank God. Nobody knows how they are, really. I'm going to use my son Trey as a quick example. As a, he would go and visit my relatives and stay with them. And they'd be like, he helps carry in the groceries. He had, they, uh, his cousin had swim practice, and his other cousin had volleyball, so there was like three giant bags they all had to carry, and he's carrying them all. And they're like, yeah, he carried them all. We offered to help, and he said, no, I got it. And I was like, who? Because this is my son. I grab all the stuff out the car, and he goes, oh, good, you got it, and turned around and walked away from me. So I was very excited that, you know, he may act that way at home, but what the world sees is somebody with, who's polite and helps and all that wonderful stuff. So anyway, I'm getting spanked every single day. Finally, my mother had had enough, and she walked in to the, day, to the preschool area and says, with, <laughs> this is being recorded, but statute of limitations. I got spanked with a wooden spoon, okay? There was, some of you are like, oh. <gasps> It was a wooden spoon. You know those pasta spoons that have the hole in the middle? I didn't know those were for pasta until I was 23 years old. I thought they were specially designed for spanking, like aerodynamics, that little, you know. So my mom walks in with the spoon, slams it on the counter, and goes, if you think he's so bad, then you spank him. And the aide was standing there and goes, What? She goes, every day I get this. It was a little folder with a chart telling us all, you know, what he had done, what I had done. She goes, oh, that's not him. They had me mixed up with another kid named Philip. Which, as silly as this sounds, I remember Philip. Philip was the one who would see how far he could chuck a truck across the room. So I took Philip's burden for a few weeks, but anyway. You know, we are so ingrained to make sure that we stand up for what is right and that we do something about it. I mean, even as Americans, like our history is what? Throwing off tyranny and standing up and fighting for what's right. And yet, in this situation, Jesus doesn't fight. You know, a lot of these messages on this particular story usually deal with this is what Jesus wrote in the dirt. Or this is the situation where we're that person that Jesus pulled up. And there's, there's all validity in that. I, I understand. Uh, as a matter of fact, I was reading in my, I have a commentary from 1850 that is huge. It's about this thick and it weighs 97,000 tons. I was going to bring it out here, but I didn't want it to tip over the podium. But it's a really neat uh, picture into how things were. Like, they have a lot of individual uh, historical references that go way beyond what I had ever thought. 
Um, I'll give you a quick example. You guys know the story Jesus told uh, Peter to go throw his nets over the other side, right? That sounds like no big deal. But according to the time period, the, the net that they had was 300 feet long. And they would stake it to the ground, and then they would sail their boat out and around. So Peter's cleaning his nets. He's putting away 300 feet of net. And Jesus is like, <laughs> just, just throw it over the other side, which basically meant that same place you just went, and now just turn around and head back the opposite direction. So it's cool stuff like that. One of the things they talk about is there's actually a Greek term that I cannot pronounce nor even really spell. And where it's talking about, where Jesus turns to these guys and says, where he's almost mad. This is where I love this. In verse 7, it says, They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. And in the King James, you know, he who is without sin cast the first stone. The Greek term in there breaks down to this. Jesus didn't just say the person who doesn't have sin. He was saying the person who has not committed this sin. You see, there's an entire article that they put in there where they discuss how uh, fornication and outside of, of the marital relation relations whichever, I'm trying to think of how to say it nicely. Sex outside of marriage. I used to be a youth pastor. I can say that. I can also say sucks from the platform. It's in my DNA. Um, but because of this was so rampant throughout the community, and the Romans at the time had no law against this. They were like, whatever, you do that, that's on you. It was so intensified that there was probably a good chance that every single one of those men there had committed adultery. And so when he says, he who has not sinned, go ahead and catch, hey, I get it, guys, but if you haven't committed what she's committed, go ahead and throw the stone. Now, that even goes according to Deuteronomy chapter 17, verse 7, where it talks about the witnesses to the crime are supposed to start throwing the stones, and then everybody else can join in. Because you have to remember, these religious leaders burst into the service and threw her in the middle of the crowd. Now, also, just so that you're aware, when they do this traditionally for the carrying out of a sentence— Usually the culprit, meaning she, is uh, half naked and, th and bound by their hands and arms and thrown into the middle of the ground. There's even stories where they would push them off of scaffolding to pay for their crime. And then if they were still alive, then they would be stoned. And so when they run in and throw her in the middle, she's probably naked and tied up. So it's not just Jesus and these religious leaders. It's a church service, too. He's teaching at this point. And can you just imagine the crowd? The teachers are like, we've got him, because he can't say no to this. And this is going to be awful. And this is what I love. I love Jesus' thought process. When the world challenged him, on his ability and authority to do things, he ignored them. Pastor Pete, I get it. You're telling me that if the world oppresses me, then I just need to ignore it. N no. But Jesus got down on his knees. And he began to write in the dirt. One of the things that they talk about is all the great men of history always felt the need to in, uh, engrave all of their, um, uh, what their deeds they've done in stone and in marble so that it would last for the generations. And in my commentary, it concurred a lot of what I've read many, many times where they basically said, 
what Jesus probably did was he either started listing their sins or started writing down their names. Because they themselves had probably committed adultery with her. And yet, as she's laying there and they're screaming at him, trying to trap him, he gets down and he starts writing it in the dust. Now, I like to think in my opinion that it was probably sin that he was spelling out as their sins or maybe it was their names but that's how much Jesus cares about sin whereas men try to immortalize their deeds by putting them in stone and in marble Jesus wrote them in dust so that it would blow away eventually not even condemning them that were doing this horrible thing That's how much Jesus loves us. That's how much Jesus cares about us. And I like how he plays that parental role. In in my house, uh, my youngest, Isaac, used to have what we referred to as the uh, mommy alarm. And maybe you have experienced this if you're a mother Um, where something happens with your children and you hear, mommy, 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 mommy. You know, it sounds like a little ambulance going by. And then finally, at least in my house growing up and every once in a while in my house, my wife will do that. You know, moms are focused and they're multitaskers. But I don't care how good a multitasker you are, when you're doing 10 things at once, number 11 just kind of gets... It'll be dealt with when nine and ten are done, okay? And so when they're do when moms are doing things and you hear mommy, 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 what? I would like to think that when Jesus was standing there preaching and they throw this girl in the middle of it, and he starts writing in the dirt, and they're like, ah, Jesus, what are you gonna do? What are you going to do? And there's all these guys standing there. What are you going to do? 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 What are you going to do now? What do you think we should do now? Do you think we should stone her, don't you? Why don't we stone her right now? Why don't we go ahead and kill her? Why don't we? And then finally he stands up and goes, that's it. Tell you what. If you don't have the same sin, if you haven't committed sin, go ahead and throw the first stone. And then I love it. He doesn't stand there and go, like a parent does, you know, we just kind of go, mm-hmm, what, what now, what? He immediately goes right back to what he was doing. If you don't have sin, go ahead and throw the first stone, okay? And I like to think that they get mad and start moving a little closer, getting ready to start to throw, and that's when they start noticing what he's written. And that's when you see them drop their stone one by one, the oldest to the youngest. Part of me likes to think that that youngest one was like, oh, we're, we're doing this today. And the older guy's like, listen, you see that right there? Oh, thanks. Boom. Drops a stone and walks off. And this is where I, why I read verse 12 like I did. Because after Jesus kind of ignores the accusers. See, that's what it's going to be like when we get to heaven. And Satan goes to start accusing you of all the things you've done wrong. Jesus kind of ignores it. He's not worried about that. Because if you have him living in you, if you are following him as a believer, if you are trusting, putting your faith in him, if you're believing that he's the son of God that died on the cross for your sins, then when Jesus stands there and the accuser's like, he did this, he did that, he broke his sister's Barbie, bent her legs completely the wrong way, Jesus is just going to ignore it. Say, but he's, he's with me. And I love how he tells her, who, where are your accusers? Where are those that are going to condemn you? They're gone. He's like, I don't condemn you either. 
And then it goes right into verse 12. He just picks right back up in his message. I hope the disciples were like ushers, and if she was naked, they were able to get her a coat and walk her out and take care of her and all this stuff. You don't read any more about her. All of a sudden, it's just, I don't condemn you. And then he goes right back to his message. And not just his message, but a declaration. I am the light of the world. If you follow me, you won't have to walk in darkness because you have the light that leads to life. I'm going to read verse 13. The Pharisees replied, you are making those claims about yourself. Such testimony is not valid. Can I tell you today, in my Bible, it's words in red, and those are the most valid words in there. They're the most valid words in there. So if you're sitting here tonight and you're saying, okay, I get that, Pastor Pete. Jesus did an amazing thing. I'm not him. Um, Just so that you're aware, I'm not Jesus either. I know some of you may have been confused about that. Um, At least Dave was. He asked me if my, no, I'm kidding. He wasn't confused at all. But I can tell you that our priority as a church And as people of God, as a Christian, somebody who is supposed to be Christ-like should be love first. One of the many times the Pharisees and Sadducees tried to trap Jesus, one of my favorite is when they uh, get him together and they go, all right, Jesus, which commandment's the best? You just, like, I'm sorry. If I was Jesus, I would have just been like, let me, guys, just give me one minute. I need to lay heavy hands upon their forehead and, you know. Or I like, you know, how Jesus could have just, I want, that's where I'm like, I want to be Elijah where I call bears out the woods to go maul people. I'm the only one who's ever felt that? Okay, that's fine. Dave, you felt that way? I see you like kind of, nope, I've never felt that way, Pastor. I don't know what you're talking about. But our priority as a church is not judgment. It's love. Because when Jesus is questioned even that, he says, (laughs) it's easy. You need to (laughs) love the Lord your God. Love him with all your mind, your soul, and your spirit. And just because I know the next question's coming, the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. I can see it right now. Their faces drop. He didn't quote, you know, they've got the Ten Commandments on them. He didn't quote any of them. Do you believe this guy? He just created new commandments. No. He summed up the first five and then the second five. Real simple. If there's one thing that I do have as an issue today, it's that the church is known more about what it's against than what it's for. We can't be that. If they know what we're for, if they know that we're for the love of Jesus, that we care about them, that we love them, folks, I'm here to tell you our biggest problem will be where to put all the people. Every church has some form of a reputation. I can tell you that right now. Every church. There's always somebody somewhere who has a reason as to why not to go. And then you have those who have a reason as why to go. I would encourage you, bring love, not judgment to the world. Jesus didn't come to judge the world. Jesus came to save the world. For God so loved that he gave his only begotten son. Sent his only son. And let me just share with you how much that it really means. I have two sons. Which means if I give one to you, I have a spare. And I love y'all. But I don't love y'all enough for that. I can tell you that God loves you so much. And those around you should feel that love. Sometimes we feel like, wait a minute, something wrong is going on, so I have to fix it. In certain situations, I would agree. 
If my children are acting up in my home as the father, it is my duty to handle that. It is my job to handle that. It is my responsibility to handle that. It is the same of my wife. We are the parents. They are the children. But too often, we're going to a government official rather than going to our Heavenly Father with the issue. So often, we forget that that's where we're supposed to go. Can I be honest with you? Every time, if you look throughout history, that the church has thrived, it is a result of persecution. Every time. Or it's people going into a situation that could seriously bring them harm. Most of the Christianity that spread through Europe happened because the Black Plague was, had run rampant and Christians moved into the communities where the Black Plague was happening and people got better and people died with dignity. And the way that they loved on people was so intensified that everybody wanted a part of it. Christians in the church were thriving in Jerusalem. Then they thrived in Antioch because there was persecution. Acts tells us as they were leaving, they preached the gospel everywhere they went. If you feel like we're a church that is being persecuted or oppressed because of different things that are happening within our nation, can I just tell you, be encouraged? Because the church thrives in these situations. This is where the rubber meets the road and our God gets to show up and show off. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, it says this simply, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Jesus wasn't the savior because he overthrew the government and let blood flow in the streets. As a matter of fact, there were people who were upset that he was not doing it. They were like, okay, he's the Messiah. He's here. He's going to erect a palace and we're going to have an army and we're going to overthrow the Romans. And that didn't happen. And they were upset. But I can tell you that he still changed the world. We are here 2,000 years later. You know, it was interesting. I, I was listening to the radio today, and they were talking about it's St. Patrick's Day. If you didn't wear your green, I'm coming for you. And don't play that I'm Irish, because then you better have orange on if you really are. Otherwise, Dave's coming for you. I'm kidding. He's not coming for you. The, they were talking about how he was born around the year 300 AD. And I, rem, I, I thought about it this afternoon, and I thought, man, how cool to be like, yeah, we're just 300 years away from when Jesus walked the earth. And then I asked the question, if you asked him, what would you rather do? Be that much closer to when Jesus walked the earth or be where we are, that much closer to his return? It's a, it's a similar question I heard a pastor once tell me. He says, do you think Abraham would have rather heard from God every 50 years or had his word to go into? I'm thankful I can go every single time. I don't have to wait for an audible voice. I can go and listen to what he has to say. Well, before we pray tonight, are there any comments, questions, concerns, heresy checks that you want to make sure I didn't do anything wrong on? 
anybody as I almost fall, but that's all right. Nobody? All right, well then tonight, before we close, I would like to pray for our nation because I feel that it needs it. It needs it all the time, but we need to make sure that we live here. We need to pray for it. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God, for the opportunity to be in a nation that has freedom of religion. Father, it doesn't matter whether our Bill of Rights says freedom of religion or that we, are, we don't have freedom of religion. We will still serve you. We will still look to you for our guidance. We thank you for the leaders that you have put in place. And God, we ask right now for you to continue to guide them however you can, Lord. Father, we lean on you, not on them, for our guidance. And we thank you that you've never left us, you've never forsaken us, and that you don't change. You don't change and flip-flop, Lord. You stay the same yesterday, today, and forever. We thank you that we can rely on you and trust in you for that. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Love you all. Have a wonderful evening. If you tell pastor that I let you out this early, he will never let you go that early ever again. If you have children in the back, please get them so that the leaders can go home sometime tonight. Love you all. God bless.